Uh, we are going to have a shift in our thinking today uh, for, from the underpinning uh, to an assessment of the present and then we're going to look at the future of strategic studies. I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation for us. In this particular session we have 90 minutes and with mili the military precision that we saw yesterday we will finish exactly on time. Each speaker in this first session uh, will speak for not more than 20 minutes and that will give us around 30 minutes for questions before we go to morning tea. Now I uh, read a lot of materials that come across my desk and the word strategic appears more often than not in all sorts of um, booklets, books, uh, discussion papers, websites and whatever. Um, for many people being strategic is a status symbol but it doesn't necessarily mean they're being strategic. And that in part I think is the problem we confront as strategic thinkers. It is everywhere. Nineteen years ago when Hugh White and I were designated to be the junior diarchy in defence, we spent a fair bit of time talking about this question of where do strategic thinkers come from and uh, we concluded, I think, they fell off trees. <laughs> like Margaret Thatcher, uh, when she was Prime Minister in Britain, uh, we thought that was not actually a very good answer. That we needed to do something more about creating a situation in which we could encourage people to get into strategic thinking and we could educate and train them in the processes that are so important. Uh, in one way or another, I think that became the genesis of what is now the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and of course, as most of you will know, uh, Hugh was in fact the first director of ASPE. Uh, nonetheless, that question, where do strategic thinkers come from, uh, is a really important one because in today's age of greater uncertainty in our strategic affairs, uh, we ought to be seeing a return to a new golden age, which is of course the theme of the next session. In our panel today, to make an assessment about the strategic situation of today, we have a stellar cast. First, we will hear from Professor Hugh White, a colleague of mine over very many years, and one I absolutely know is ready to ask the tough, hard questions and posit provocative answers to encourage debate in exploration of the issues. He's going to look at the situation pertaining today from an Australian perspective. He will no doubt talk about the contestability of ideas and he'll be looking at our situation from an enormous amount of experience that you can read about in the conference brochure. Following Hugh, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Peter Ho uh, from Singapore, a very experienced uh, senior uh, public servant, uh, having worked in some very fascinating and demanding uh, positions in Singapore from a strategic studies perspective. Peter today is very much associated with the Centre for New Strategic Futures and uh, I did spend some time last week trawling through that site to have a look at the work they've been doing. Uh, Peter will speak about strategic studies from a Southeast Asian perspective and I'm looking forward very much to hearing what he has to say because I think this is a nascent area where there is growth already underway. And of course, uh, his particular address in this session will lead into one of the topics in the final session of the conference. Finally, to round off our speaker list, we're going to hear from Professor Elliot Cohn, who will address the tricky topic, Elliot, of training the next generation of strategic thinkers. Uh, and in my uh, notes, I, I have remarked, not educating. Uh, so this should be kind of interesting from my perspective. Elliot, of course, has written extensively on matters of strategic studies 
and a range of associated matters. Uh, from my own perspective, his book on Supreme Command, which addresses the relationships between civilian leaders and the military in the context of decision-making in crisis, remains a standard text for the education of all our future leaders. And I don't just mean military leaders. For more detailed information on our speakers, uh, the detail is in the conference booklet. But without any further ado, I now ask Professor Hugh White to lead off our proceedings. Hugh. Well, uh, good morning and thanks, Chris. It is um, sort of traditional to say at this stage of the proceedings what a pleasure it is to share the platform with uh, my co-appearers, but on this occasion it really does mean something. Uh, Chris and I, as he's been kind enough to say, go back a very long way. Peter and I did a lot of work together when we were both public servants, civil servants, in helping to construct the remarkable relationship we have with Singapore. And I think I can honestly say that no one has taught me more about American strategic policy and perspectives than Elliot. He and I have been talking about this for 25 years or something scary. Anyway, long time. So, lovely to be here. Um, and can I just say how nice it is to appear at the 50th anniversary of this institution um, and to congratulate Brendan on picking up the pieces when I handed it to him and bringing it together so well um, to look at, for the institution to look so sort of bonny and, and blooming at its 50th birthday. But as I'm afraid Brendan might regard as characteristic, I'm going to express my thanks to him for giving me this opportunity but not quite doing what he's told me to do. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to speak on strategic studies in practice because it does seem to me that ours is primarily a practical discipline. That is, we bring scholarship to bear on real practical questions, urgent and very important questions that governments face. And I'm very happy to speak about Australia specifically. And I'm going to be a bit parochial. This is going to be very Australia focused. Because SDSC has always and should always put Australia at the centre of its business. What is our job? Our job is to bring the instruments and tools and virtues of scholarship to bear on the strategic policy questions that Australia faces. And so, as this is an anniversary, I do think it's fitting to do that by reflecting a little bit about history as a framework for getting into uh, our analysis of what we need to do in future, the future of Australian strategic studies. And in particular, a history of the distinctively Australian strategic questions, how we've approached them in the past and what that can tell us about what we need to do in future. Now, Bob O'Neill in his um, splendid address to us the other night reminded us that questions of strategic questions, questions about the role of armed force in international affairs, have been with us since European settlement of this continent since modern Australia emerged. So there was no era of pre-strategic innocence where Australia was just a collection of sweet young things on a continent of our own um, living in innocence. We were born in strategic sin, if you like. Uh, we were absolutely a product of British power, as Bob mentioned, a product of the extraordinary preponderance of British maritime power in, the, in what we now call the Indo-Pacific area after the Seven Years' War. We were, amongst other things, established to provide a naval base. And that was a naval base reflected in very active strategic rivalry in this region. The astonishing fact that La Perouse turned up in Botany Bay, what was it, four days or something after Arthur Phillips' first fleet of, arrived, arrived there, it just tells you how intense was the strategic environment in which Australia was born. And our teenage years, if I can put it that way, the first few decades anyway, were overshadowed by the Napoleonic Wars, and it's something I think we don't pay enough attention to, that Australia wouldn't be today what Australia is today. Australia would perhaps never have got going as it is today, had it not been for British success in those, in that long and terrible battle. And even in the peace that followed, Australia never quite lost consciousness of strategic issues. You only have to go to Sydney Harbour and see Fort Denison sitting there, 
absurdly in the middle of the harbour to see that really all the way through our history we've had a sense of strategic risk and the policy responses required for us. But, and here's the big point, for the first century after European settlement, there was no distinctively Australian strategic questions. People in Australia thought strategically about our security. But our thinking about that was absolutely embedded in the extraordinary global, em global empire of which we are part and inseparable from it. Our strategic questions were all imperial, not national. That changed, and every so often history does you a favour and allows you to put a date. That changed in 1883. You could say that changed in April 1883. Because in that month, colonial governments, alarmed by European intrusions into the Southwest Pacific, and conscious of the changing distribution of power in Europe, sought that had driven that the European intrusion, the French and the Germans in particular, sought a strong imperial response from Whitehall to remove what was seen to be a significant deterioration in our strategic environment and didn't get it. Whitehall said no. That was a new situation. And the Australian statesmen, they were all men, of the time knew it. If they, could no, they knew that they could no longer assume that Australia's strategic interests and objectives were identical with those perceived in Whitehall and that we could rely on Whitehall to uphold them. We could no longer assume, in other words, that London would make Asia safe for us. And we had to start thinking for ourselves and acting for ourselves to pursue a distinctly Australian strategic policy responsive to Australian strategic imperatives. And they immediately saw, with astonishing speed, the key factors which would govern the way we had to think about those questions. They saw the strange paradox that Australia is uniquely, well, uniquely except for New Zealand, uniquely isolated from the main centres of global power, but uniquely engaged through our alliances, as we now call them, with the global balance. And the tension between our geographic isolation and our strategic enmeshment produced the key dilemmas that have shaped Australian strategic policy, one could say, ever since. And one way of expressing that dilemma is to say that the distance from the major power centres, and particularly from our great allies, meant that we couldn't depend on our allies the way we had in the past, the way we'd like to. And the scale of our own continent and the slenderness of our own resources meant that we had to depend on our allies because we couldn't do it by ourselves. We couldn't depend on our allies, but we had to depend on our allies. That is the dilemma which has driven and shaped, provided, if you like, the sort of locomotive force for Australian strategic thinking ever since. And looking back, how clear-sighted that generation was, people like Deakin and Service and so on, and how courageous they were in facing what must have been for them a psychologically, as well as practically, extraordinarily stressful recognition and how decisive they were in responding to it. One of their responses, of course, was federation. And they did it, it must be said, not without a great deal of public debate, but without the benefit of an academic strategic study centre to tell them what to do. And they built quite a sophisticated policy to balance these imperatives, to balance the, 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 the imperatives for alliance or the imperatives for looking after ourselves to depend on our allies or defend for ourselves. And it was lucky they did because the strategic era they ended up facing, we ended up facing in the ensuing century between the 1880s and shall we say the early 1970s was more demanding than they could possibly have imagined. The First World War, Second World War, Cold War in Asia. What would they have thought had they, could, could they have seen what was coming at them in their country? And of course the approach we took, which included a very strong commitment to supporting our allies globally, carried terrible costs for us. We are just a few days past the centenary of Fromel after all. And I don't think we explore enough whether those decisions, particularly the decision in the First World War, was the right decision, whether it was the right way for Australia to reconcile those conflicting tensions I mentioned. I'm not at all sure that it wasn't, but I don't think we can be, I think we'd learn a lot from really asking 
whether it was or not, which is not something I think we do. In 1966, when Tom Miller set up SDSC, those key questions, how much do we depend on our allies, how much do we fend for ourselves, driven by that fundamental dilemma, were still there. They were, the still, they were still the same challenges. But what he decided, and what others around him, the others that supported him decided, was that it might help to bring scholarship to bear on those questions. Partly that was a reflection of international trends. A discipline of strategic studies had grown up elsewhere in the world in circumstances which Laurie set out for us very elegantly yesterday. But also in response to astonishingly powerful local imperatives. It is no coincidence that SDSC was founded 50 years ago this year. Australia then was right on the threshold, indeed was already within an astonishingly complex transformation of our strategic environment, which in some ways I think we still don't understand. It was certainly one of perhaps the biggest transformation of our strategic environment since that dramatic moment in 1883. It completely overtook the grand strategy of the day, forward defence, uh, which we developed to deal with the post-World War II, post-colonial era Asia that we found ourselves living in. And again, look, look, look at what was coming to Australia in the years after 1966. What they didn't know they were doing. They didn't know it was coming when they set up SDSC. But escalation, and we just got into Vietnam. Escalation and failure in Vietnam were on the horizon. The British withdrawal east of Suez and the Guam Doctrine were just around the corner. But also, not yet at all clear in 1966, but just around the corner, was the transformation of Southeast Asia as a strategic region into something far more benign than we could possibly have imagined. The transformation of the US-China relationship and with it the major power order in Asia after 1972. Taken together, that, that produced the end of the Cold War in Asia and the creation of a US-led order in Asia which, of which we've been the enormous beneficiaries ever since. That whole set of developments in the years after 1966 was the biggest shift in the role of allies in, in, the, in the Asian order and in Australia's security since 1883. And it drove, of course, a fundamental new set of policy choices for Australia, new answers to the question, how far do we defend on our, depend on our allies and how far do we defend for ourselves? And SDSC was right at the heart of that. In a sense, one way of thinking about SDS history is to date it not from the date on which the institution itself was established, but the date on which Tom Miller published a book, Australia's Defence, which was the first serious systematic academic attempt to get, a head around, get our heads around those questions. And right on the flyleaf of, of, of the dust cover of Australia's Defence, big writing, can Australia defend itself? Can Australia defend itself? That was the question that SDSC was established to answer at a time when the future of our alliances in Asia was profoundly uncertain. And of course that debate that followed shifted the balance between self-reliance and the alliance in a long process that led from 1966 to 1976, a decade later, 40th anniversary of the 1976 White Paper, very important moment itself. And of course, 10 years on the 1986 and the Dib Review, 30th anniversary of the Dib Review, a very important anniversary. It took us 20 years from 1966 to get our heads around what that meant. And that's actually nothing necessarily wrong with that. They were very big questions. And of course, it was accompanied by a major public debate major public, d debates of an intensity and sophistication and volume and passion on defence and foreign policy issues that we in Australia today can hardly imagine. And it was driven, of course, partly by Vietnam. That provided the kind of emotional locomotive. But it was also driven by a, a, a very broad public understanding of how Asia was changing and what that meant for us. If you doubt that, go back and read that great text of, uh, of Australian 
self-imaging at the time, the lucky country, Donald Horn. The first chapter, the, the beginning of the first chapter of a lucky country says something like, I was sitting on the porch of, a, of the something or other club in Hong Kong and my Chinese friend said to me, you know, you're gonna be people from all over Asia. The lucky country was all about that question of how Australia related to a rising Asia. And it was about questions of identity. There was a very strong element, one of the things that drove that debate in the 60s and 70s was questions about how we see ourselves. Exactly the point that Brendan was making in his speech over dinner last night. And in that, SDSC played a key role in all of that. A very important feature of that was that the participants at that stage in that era all had direct, or at least relatively direct, experience of a major war in our region. Bob O'Neill's story, sitting around the family radio on the 10th of December. It's, it's very important when we think about what they did then, it's very important to remember that that was a generation for whom the idea of major power conflict in Asia with profound and very unsettling in, um, implications for the kind of relationship we had our allies, that was a lived personal experience. And it profoundly affected the way they thought about the questions. Their understanding of Australia's strategic risks and their sense of the policy imperatives. And so they built a post-Vietnam strategic posture of which the self-reliant defence of Australia was right at the core, although with very carefully limited conception of the strategic objectives that we would have in, that, in, in implementing that policy. And here's the paradox, that the policy that we built on that basis, that people at SDSC and Paul, of course, in particular, had such a big role in developing, paradoxically became a golden age for our alliance with the United States. Partly that's because the whole posture we built was only possible because of one of the key features of the strategic shift that I mentioned before. That is the emergence of the US as the uncontested dominant power in Asia. In fact, it took Australia back to something very like what we'd seen before 1883. Before 1883, British power in Asia had been uncontested. And so although we had a few strategic thoughts, it was all pretty easy. After 1972, after Nixon went to China, despite defeat in Vietnam, US primacy in Asia became uncontested. And that simply meant that the alliance ended at a golden age in which the costs to the US of maintaining its alliance in Asia and the costs to Australia of supporting it were very low and the benefits were very high. Our interests and objectives were very clearly aligned and very cheaply achieved. And as a result, slowly, over the decades that followed, the alliance became, again, more and more central. It became more and more natural to assume that a very strong alliance at very low cost very strong alignment of strategic interests was normal. And this became, for example, in recent years, decade or so, became kind of enshrined in a slightly Whiggish model of our strategic history, whereby uh, what, we've, what we've seen, all of the bumps and lumps and anxieties have been washed away, and what we've seen is a long arc of ever-increasing Anglo-Saxon global prominence, dominance producing Tony Abbott's favourite strategic concept, the Anglosphere. Well, those of you who know something about my preoccupations will imagine where I'm going to take this next. Because it does bring us to today. The core question about Australia's strategic position today is whether or not the United States will continue to play the same role in Asia and the same role in Australia's security as it's played since the mid-1970s. And if not, what do we do instead? That is, that is what will determine the way in which we see the balance between depending on our allies and depending for ourselves. And it arises, of course, because of a really very big shift in the distribution of power in Asia over the last few decades, and particularly over about the last decade, with a corresponding shift, I would say, in the strategic objectives of the great powers in Asia especially China, and a very substantial return 
to strategic rivalry in the region that have kind of dominated the region and shaped Australia's strategic situation in that ugly 90 years between 1883 and the early 1970s. And this is a question, the questions that arise from that are ones that we have as a country not yet effectively addressed. We've tried. We've tried in particular in three white papers uh, over five years, you know, nine and 13 and 16. All of them show deep ambivalence on this core question about how far we can assume that the United States will continue to play the same role and therefore we can continue to operate on the same basis. All of them acknowledge the fundamental shift, but all of them conclude there's no reason fundamentally to change our policy. All of them are confident that despite the fundamental shift in distribution of wealth and power, the, the strategic order in Asia and America's role in it will not change. And their confidence of that actually becomes more strident with each white paper. It seems to me that the, that the 2009 white paper was the best of those three, the most engaged most seriously in that, in that dilemma, and the 2016 one least seriously. Those 56, is that the right number? Anyway, I think it's 56 occurrences of the phrase rules-based global order. Let's be clear, rules-based global order is a euphemism for US primacy. And the 56 recurrences, if that is the number of that phrase, is that bell ringing, nothing's gonna change. Well, good luck with that. I think the ex extent of the complacency in our strategic policy is overshadowed by the overhyped decisions for very modest and exceptionally slow increases in our maritime capability. In effect, Australia is doing nothing to respond to what is a really fundamental change in our strategic order, a change which is comparable to the changes of 1883 and 1966, to which our predecessors responded with such figure. So those are the questions we need to debate. We need to debate how big actually is the challenge to the US-led order. This is a subject on which you can legitimately debate. And it involves judgments about China's power and judgments about China's ambition and resolve. It involves judgments about America's power and about America's objectives and resolve. It's a judge that embeds, amongst other things, judgments about the value of US allies and how much US allies really are, touches that, that Tom touched on yesterday. Um, and, uh, and the attitudes of other great powers and the role they'll play, for example, Japan and India. All of these things are up to debate. None of them are we debating with the clarity and the force that we need to debate. We also need to ask ourselves, well, what are the alternatives? What does it mean for us if US order, if the US role in Asia does significantly change? What, are the what kinds of alternative orders in Asia might we have as a basis for stability if the US order, order no longer proves sustainable? And what are the implications for Australia if there's no stability to be had and if we end up living in a much more contested region. Now the debate on that second question has hardly begun because we're still stuck on the first question. And I think it's partly because not just are Australians, I think, far too optimistic about the answer, but I think Americans are too. It does seem to me that, that the right at the heart of the US approach to China today is a is it generally, not universally, but generally a very serious underestimation of the, se of the seriousness of the challenge that China poses. And I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but just to pick up on the point that Alan Bean made yesterday about the relationship between economics and strategy, that relationship is very complex, but there's a very big simple thing right at the heart of it, and that is that the primary source of strategic weight is economic scale, as economic power shifts, strategic power shifts, as strategic power shifts, orders change. You'd have to believe that Asia can be transformed fundamentally economically and be unchanged strategically to be as confident of the future of US primacy in Asia as I think our policy today, and as I think US policy today presupposes. And I think that's extraordinarily unlikely. Now on one, way, one, one level, it's not surprising that we're finding this set of questions so difficult to deal with. They are extremely uncomfortable. The practical implications, in terms of the order we might see in Asia and the kinds of responses we might make to it, are immense, immense. 
the speaker of foreign policy questions or strategic policy questions as australia has ever faced and what one might call the psychological implications are very big too goes back to brendan's point last night these are questions of identity when i started working on this issue some years ago i remember a very dear friend and colleague of mine saying to me hugh i just completely disagree with you about what you're saying with me when i wrote the power shift court the essay and Australia, which did not have the kind of reliance we have with, with the United States today, would simply not be Australia. I think a lot of people believe that. I don't think we can afford to define our identity that way, much as I love America. And it's worth making the point that, partly because of the practical and partly because of those identity issues, refusal to engage in these questions is totally, purely, spectacularly bipartisan. Neither side of politics wants to touch it. But I think also underlying that is a kind of a deeper thing. Laura Tingle, a couple of months ago, a few months ago, published a really good quarterly essay called Political Amnesia, in which she said that one of the things that's gone wrong with Australian government over the last decade or so, and I think we'd all agree something has gone wrong with Australian government over the last decade or so, is, is, a, is a great inability to understand our own history and I think that's something that's hitting us very hard in our field. Our approach to strategic questions today is based on the assumption not just that the alliance as it exists today is nice, but that it's always been that way. We've forgotten that the alliances have ever been different, that we've thought about our strategic situation differently from the way we do. We cannot, can't imagine Australia without it. And we don't have a sense, I don't think, strong enough of what SDSC's role in that has been. I think it's vital to getting Australia's strategic policy right, I think it's vital to getting SDSC's role in the future of Australian strategic policy right that we remember that history a bit more clearly. Thank you very much. First, I do not consider myself an expert on strategic studies. Uh, secondly, I do not think that a Southeast Asian perspective on strategic studies exists. In fact, as far as I'm aware, in Southeast Asia, there's only one institute that is properly focused on the full range of strategic studies, and that is Singapore's S. Roger Adam School of International Studies, or RSIS. Uh, and my encounters with strategic studies uh, have been tangential and my first encounter was when I was in military service and uh, studying uh, in our command and staff course and of course strategic studies was uh, part of that program. And some years after I completed the command and staff course, I led, led a review of the whole command and staff college system and unsurprisingly, the review asserted the importance of strategic studies. So not only did strategic studies remain at the core of the various programs run by the Command and Staff College, but a Department of Strategic Studies was also established. The teaching of strategic studies was outsourced to the new Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies, which later on became a full school, the RSIS. Uh, that was, I think, about 10 years later in 2007. And this gained for the Command and Staff College access to a team of experts whose primary business was strategic studies. This enhanced the quality of teaching in this important area for our military officers. And in return, it anchored strategic studies as a core capability of the uh, RSIS or IDSS. So at this point, it might be useful to ask a basic question, and not the basic question of where the strategy come from, but why is strategic studies important? I discovered its value later on in civilian life, both when I worked on plans and policies in the Ministry of Defense, as well as in my various postings to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and later on when I was in charge of national security and intelligence coordination. And it was in these positions that strategic studies came alive to me. In fact, far more than it did when I was uh, doing my military service. 
It provided an important foundation to help me understand the world, to discover the drivers of grand strategy, to uncover the impulses of foreign policy, and to develop an instinct about how nations and governments respond to challenges. It helped me to connect strategy to operations and plans, and to frame decisions in their conceptual, intellectual, historical, and ideological context. But I also found that strategic studies are largely based on hindsight and historical insight. While my experience in planning and policy making taught me that things never follow a predictable trajectory, especially in the medium to long term. Indeed, one of the foremost challenges facing anyone in the business of planning, policy making, is the challenge of strategic surprise. Now, most of us have heard of black swans, a term coined by Nicholas Nassim Taleb, and these are rare, hard to predict events that have a large game-changing impact. And later on in 2002, this was after 9-1-1, U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld introduced us to a relative of the black swan, the unknown unknowns. And in Singapore, and I'm sure in Australia you've had your equivalent, we've had encounters with black swans and unknown unknowns in recent years. The Asian financial crisis of 1997-98, 9-1-1, the uncovering of the Jamaya Islamaya terrorist network in December 2001, the global economic and financial crisis, Arab Spring, if you will, the rise of ISIS, Brexit, and so on. You know, the list is almost endless. But one thing that uh, is apparent to me is that the frequency of such strategic shocks is increasing and the amplitude of their impact is growing. We can have a whole discussion on why, but I got no time now. Lenin explained in a way why, when he said everything is connected to everything else. And globalization increases its connections, as does the internet. And in such a connected world, what happens in one part of the world is going to affect other parts of the world. You can't hide. This is a so-called butterfly effect which postulates that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil can set off a tornado in Texas. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once said, life is understood backwards, but must be lived forwards. In other words, you can look backwards in time to understand why something happened. Uh, you know, if you're very sophisticated, you call this retrospective coherence, but in more simple language, it's hindsight. And that's what strategic studies do very well. But hindsight is not necessarily able to tell you what is going to happen when you look forward in time. And that is the problem. We cannot predict the future. At this point, I would like to introduce to you, a new member of my menagerie, the black elephant. <laughs> now what is a black elephant? It is a cross between a black swan and the elephant in the room. <laughs> the black elephant is a problem that is actually visible to everyone, the proverbial elephant in the room, but no one wants to deal with it so they pretend it's not there. And when the problem blows up, everyone pretends to be surprised or shocked, behaving as if it were a black swan. All human beings, whether you are a man in the street, the highest decision maker in the land, we all have blind spots. The tendency of the human mind is to underestimate sudden crisis whether because of their own cognitive biases or because it is inconvenient to admit to the obvious. So initially, through hesitation, 
And until events reach crisis proportions, nobody takes any action. This can lead to military failure, for example, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, 1941, Yom Kippur War, 1973. ISIS could arguably be described as a black elephant. Uh, President Obama admitted in 2014 that the US underestimated the threat posed by ISIS fighters in Syria and overestimated the effectiveness of the security forces in Iraq. Uh, most recently, I myself was astonished to learn that the Treasury in the UK had made no contingency plans for Brexit. Surely this is another example of a black elephant. My view is that we must learn to think as systematically about a future that is inherently volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, just as we think about the past that is known or knowable. In this regard, strategic studies can do a lot to help reduce the frequency of strategic shock and when the inevitable shock occurs to mitigate its amplitude or intensity. There are foresight methodologies, ways to think about the future systematically, even though you should not pretend that you're predicting the future. There are ways using these foresight methodologies to overcome some of our latent biases and our inherent cognitive limitations. One of them is the famous scenario planning method, which was developed and pioneered by Shell, the oil giant. And Shell famously avoided the impact of the oil shock in the 70s because of scenario planning. It was only oil major, I think, to make money out of that period. But I have not seen much evidence that strategic studies has adopted such tools, and perhaps it's too unconventional. In Singapore, the Ministry of Defence made it an imperative to find ways to better anticipate changes in technology and in the operating environment. And in the late 80s, it started using Shell's scenario planning techniques. Then in 1991, encouraged by the Ministry of Defense's positive experiences with scenario planning, a scenario planning office, which is now called the Strategic Policy Office, was set up in the Prime Minister's office to apply the technique to issues affecting the entire nation and not just the defense and security sector. Today, National level scenario planning exercises are run every few years. And apart from these efforts, which deal with issues at a national scale, focused scenario planning stud studies on specific issues like climate change or when significant geopolitical change seems imminent are conducted. In the Singapore experience, we have discovered that when scenarios are well crafted and articulate imaginative yet plausible ways in which the future could evolve, planners and policy makers will begin to move out of their comfort zones, begin to think the unthinkable, and more willingly explore fresh strategies. Scenario planning helps to inculcate an anticipatory mindset in planners and policy makers so that they instinctively raise what if questions on the issues they deal with. But scenario planning, unfortunately, is not very useful in locating black swans and the unknown unknowns. The Nobel economist and strategic thinker Thomas Schelling explained, one thing a person cannot do, no matter how rigorous his analysis or heroic his imagination, is to draw up a list of things that would never occur to him. So, to address this deficiency, even if partially, in Singapore, we have adopted other tools. While scenario planning remains the base, a wider range of foresight tools such as horizon scanning, backcasting, causal layer analysis are now deployed. Collectively, we refer to these tools as Scenario Planning Plus or SP Plus. And these tools help planners to discover some, but certainly not all, of the black swans and unknown unknowns lurking beyond the horizon. Horizon scanning 
tries to identify the big game changes by looking for emerging trends and issues and delving into them to see where the threats and opportunities are. And what are the big game changes now? There's a lot of them. Some of them are to be found in the current wave of technological innovations taking place in the IT sphere, information technology. It's not just about data and data analytics. It is also includes the Internet of Things, cloud computing, drones, robotics, 3D printing. But this is not just about innovation and opportunity. There's the downside. Serious people like Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk have all warned that artificial intelligence might pose an existential risk, not to the country, but to the world. Cyber threats, we all know now, are very serious. Last year, three power grids in the Ukraine were brought down by hackers using techniques which look remarkably similar to Stuxnet. And earlier this year, thieves siphoned off $81 million US dollars from Bangladesh Bank in a sophisticated cyber heist. The other big issue is demographics is a perennial. Water is another. Many countries are going to face water shortages because they have carelessly drained their water tables. In other words, they have used up a non-renewable resource, underground water. Furthermore, many other countries are now facing the effects of climate change, such as changing weather patterns and disruptions to rainfall. And the resulting water shortages are not mere inconveniences. They are an issue of survival and therefore have huge security and strategic implications. Now, such emerging strategic issues have the potential to become game changers. The question is, which ones should we focus on? Which ones are going to evolve into the big challenges and which are going to be big opportunities? And this is where strategic studies can develop a deeper understanding of such issues and to separate the existential from the merely inconvenient. Wicked problems are highly complex. Their causes and other influencing factors cannot be easily determined. Furthermore, they have multiple stakeholders who see these problems from different perspectives and they will have different, uh, different goals. This means that there is no immediate or obvious solution because nobody can agree on what the problems are in the first place, never mind what the solutions should be. Crises are often wicked problems. Terrorism is a particularly wicked problem. Some of you might be surprised by this assertion because you think that all of us would want to get rid of terrorism, except of course the terrorists. But even if everyone agreed that terrorism should be banished, it is not clear to me that the policy prescriptions would gain universal acceptance. If it were the case, then terrorism would not be the persistent problem it is today and ISIS would not be a serious threat. We all work in organizations that respect hierarchy, and this is how human systems work. But in a wicked problem where there are multiple stakeholders, more likely than not, there will be different organizations managing different parts of the problem. It should be an imperative to be able to bring these different organizations together to address the wicked problem in its totality. And in Singapore, we call this the whole of government approach. Tackling the Jamaa Islamiyah is a wicked problem for Singapore. And it's not just about removing the immediate threat that J.I. posed to Singapore's security in December 2001. It also requires engaging multiple stakeholders, including the community groups. It means engaging the private sector to develop the protective systems, processes, and infrastructure. This approach clearly needs not just many agencies of government coming together, but bringing in the people and the private sectors. In a way, it was not just a whole of government approach, but a whole of nation approach. The Singapore approach was to fight the JI network with a whole of, whole of nation network. In the context of strategic studies, it seems to me that the analogue of the whole of government approach is the net assessment approach, one that is done very well in the Australian Office of National Assessments. Information from all sources 
across disciplines are shared, evaluated holistically, so that complex situations are studied as a whole and not just in their parts. This approach helps connect the dots by thinking broadly, by considering how different events, drivers and agents interact with each other, we can see the larger picture and obtain a better fix on the possible outcomes. However, efforts to understand our complex world often rely on an assumption that what is complex can be reduced into simpler subsets that are easier to evaluate and when re-aggregated will produce results that approximate the real world. This approach is called reductionism. It is rooted in the belief that complex phenomena can be analysed in component and simpler parts. Now, unfortunately, despite the enormous importance of this approach, it gives a false impression that investigating the features of, a, of things in, at a holistic level is less informative than investigating the properties of the components. And I would argue that strategic studies have tended towards the reductionist approach rather than looking at situations in a more holistic way. Net assessment, horizon scanning, all require this ability to look at situations holistically. And this is important because, as I said earlier, everything is connected to everything else. So this is an argument for strategic studies to move beyond its traditional focus on politics and security, and to enlarge the view of the world to see how economics, demographics, societal issues, culture, environment, technology, all interact with each other to produce the complexities of our operating environment. Before I conclude, I would like to connect my remarks to the topic which is the Southeast Asian perspective. Maybe there's no Southeast Asian perspective on strategic studies, but there is a difference between how people look at issues. In his studies of culture, of cultures, the geography of thought, Richard Nisbet identified a major cognitive difference between Western and Asian, and Asian includes Southeast Asia, between Western and Asian cultures. At the risk of oversimplification, after looking at a picture of, a, of, say, a horse, Westerners tend to remember the horse. But Asians will also recall the background, whether the, there were clouds in the sky, whether the sky was blue, whether the grass was green. The question is whether strategic studies can normalize this difference, perhaps by taking a more holistic an interdisciplinary approach, and in so doing, create a better and common understanding of the big challenges and issues. Good plans and policies acknowledge the uncertainties and complexities of the operating environment. Strategic studies should likewise acknowledge these uncertainties and complexities and embrace the tools of foresight and future thinking, look at issues holistically, from which they can derive new insights that can inform the work of policy planners and uh, policy makers. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to uh, want to begin uh, by congratulating SDSC, and I want to thank my hosts for their uh, hospitality. Uh, if I had been invited to speak as a policy expert, I would have begun by uh, glaring at Hugh White and saying, preponderance. <laughs> but I won't do that. Um, instead, I was, Paul Dibb is encouraging me, but, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm tempted, but I won't. The, the topic I was given was training the next generation of strategic thinkers. Uh, I think I was given that in my role as a school teacher. And since that's really what I am and how I think of myself, uh, I'm quite happy with that up to a point. Um, so like a good uh, school teacher, let me begin by looking closely at the exam question. And I'm going to begin by rejecting the first word, training. 
And the reason why I reject it, uh, to give you a sort of a shorthand version, is it seems to me that training means preparing people to do well what you think they ought to do in the way that you think they ought to do it. Education, I believe, is preparing other people to do well what they think they ought to do, the questions they think they ought to ask in the way that they think is most appropriate. We continue to, to parse the question. There's a missing word, the word is we. How do we propose to educate the next generation of strategic thinkers? Strategic studies is not value neutral. Most of us here are not, I know I certainly am not, interested in educating strategic thinkers for the Islamic State. I'm not actually interested in educating strategic thinkers on either the Russian or the Chinese general staffs. Uh, strategic studies, as it, the term uh, in the form that now exists, is after all a post-World War II phenomenon of the West. Uh, it spread out from there and it did to some extent in various ways spread to the old Soviet Union and to China. Um, although there it was quite different. Now, let me be very clear, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of very sophisticated strategic thought in those countries and lots of other countries. And indeed, I would say one of the weaknesses of strategic studies is it often ends up simply being a gloss on American national security policy and defense policy and how Americans have thought about these things as opposed to exploring other nations' strategic thought. But, but the fact is, strategic studies as a field has been, it's very interesting in a number of ways, it has been civilian dominated, unlike the situation in, in uh, particularly in, I would say, in Russia and China. And it is not value neutral, nor indeed would I argue should it be. It presupposes some very basic presuppositions, beginning with the idea that war is a bad thing and should be used reluctantly, not necessarily as a last resort, uh, but reluctantly. I would argue that strategic studies as it now exists also presupposes a basic political stance in favor of free institutions and limited government. And I think that's inevitable. What about the word generation? What's the next generation? Well, uh, again, you have to dissect, well, what do we mean by generation? It's always a, an interesting topic for intellectual historians. Let me suggest that there are four generations of uh, strategic people who've been writing about and thinking about strategic studies. There is a found, was a founding generation of which there are really only two major figures left, both alas in frail health, uh, Michael Howard and uh, Andrew Marshall both in their 90s. Other figures familiar to many of us here, Hedley Bull, Sam Huntington, Albert Wolstetter, Raymond Arone. Uh, these were the people who founded the field and they had their distinct set of intellectual projects dealing with the advent of nuclear weapons, the protracted conflict of the Cold War, civil military relations. They were profoundly shaped by the Second World War which they had either experienced very directly which they experienced as, uh, at that age where you become of political awareness, uh, say, in one's teens. There was a successor generation, which is represented here, if, if I may say so, I think Bob O'Neill is the, uh, the senior representative of that successor generation. It was a smaller generation for a variety of reasons, a lot having to do with Vietnam and other things, molded very much by the Cold War, and I would, I would say that many of those of us, and I would view myself as coming at the tail end of this generation, most of us expected that to go on pretty much forever. Um, and that affected our intellectual projects, arms control, the conventional balance in Europe, to some extent post-Cold War stability operations, the revolution in military affairs. <coughs> There's a third generation, which is represented here, just speaking about the Americans, I would, uh, I would point to people like uh, Tom Christensen and Hal Brands and Dan Marston, uh, who came of political and intellectual age in the 1990s, for whom 9-11 was in some ways a defining shock. Their intellectual projects have included things like 
terrorism studies, counterinsurgency, grand strategy, hybrid war, whether or not we think that's a useful term, civil-military relations in a different context, Asian great power politics. And then there's a fourth generation, and in many ways that's the generation that uh, I think we should focus on, and that's some of the younger people out here in this audience. People whose memories of 9-11 uh, will really be that of adolescence, if that. The point that I want to make is those first two generations were powerfully shaped by the Cold War and by the Second World War. And that left its intellectual imprint on the field. And part of our challenge going forward as teachers is how to get beyond the thrall of both the Second World War and the Cold War. Another part of that question of who's the next generation is we have to say, well, who's the audience? Who are we trying to educate? And I'd say it's actually quite a large audience. It includes bureaucrats and academics, analysts and think tanks, in some cases politicians, opinion shapers, soldiers, a very large and diverse group who are going to do different kinds of things with their lives. Well, what about the word strategic? Uh, and, of course, there's a large debate about security studies versus strategic studies. There is a, an old-fashioned definition of strategic studies as being about the preparation and use of military power to serve the ends of policy. Uh, that is a definition which is old-fashioned, narrow, and intellectually restrictive. And that's why I like it. I think the, the danger in uh, much broader definitions of strategic studies is the danger of intellectual diffusion. It's the danger of equating the word strategic with the word important. And so this way, I think I, I might respectfully disagree with my friend Peter Ho. It seems to me there can be issues which are extraordinarily important issues of national policy, uh, which in some cases involve danger to life and limb, which are nonetheless not really strategic in the sense of um, strategic studies as I think about it. What about thinkers? Well, what do thinkers do other than think? They write, I suppose, interestingly, they write a little bit differently now than they do in the past, but I want to use that as a way of raising a warning flag about the intellectualism of strategic studies. It seems to me as I reflect and uh, thinking about these remarks, and I reflect on the field, it seems to me it is sometimes valued ideas over implementation, concepts over contingency, abstractions over personalities and circumstances, sometimes indeed theology over the practical arts. Okay, so what are the implications for education? Well, in some ways I would say as they ever were, and I want to illustrate that with two quotations. So the first is from, you know, you always have to have a sacred text. The sacred text in strategic studies is on war. Um, and so I begin with a quotation from the introductory note to, uh, to Clausewitz's work, where he says that, you know, this is not a book for Napoleon. Napoleon doesn't need this book. Um, Napoleon acts on instinct, and the rest of us can't really improve it, and then this book can't turn you into Napoleon. He then continues, yet when it is not a question of acting oneself, but of persuading others in discussion, the need is for clear ideas and the ability to show their connection with each other. So few people have yet acquired the necessary skill at this, that most discussions are a futile bandying of words. Either they leave each man sticking to his own ideas, or they end with everyone agreeing for the sake of agreement on a compromise with nothing to be said for it. Clear ideas on these matters do therefore have some practical value. Uh, I've been in the Situation Room in the White House and Deputies Committee's meetings. That is exactly what happened. Clausewitz knew exactly what he was talking about. And that's why he says the purpose of theory is to guide the self-education of commanders. It seems to me that the fundamental idea here in Clausewitz about what is the use of all this it's not that different from that of a near contemporary, Cardinal Newman, in his 
uh, famous and powerfully influential lectures on the idea of a university, which in many ways shaped the, the notion of liberal education as we have understood it. What Newman says is that a liberal education is the education which gives a man, okay, it's gendered language, I understand, a clear conscious view of his own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. It teaches him to see things as they are, to go right to the point, to disentangle a skein of thought, to detect what is sophistical, and to discard what is irrelevant. It prepares him to fill any post with credit and to master any subject with facility. It shows him how to accommodate himself to others, how to throw himself into their state of mind, how to bring before them his own, how to influence them, how to come to an understanding with them, how to bear with them. I would submit that at its heart, strategic studies is, oddly enough, a branch of the liberal arts. Or at least it is, in a certain way, understandable as liberal education. And that, in some ways, is actually not so odd, because actually it is connected in a certain way with citizenship. It is connected with the idea or at least the supposition, of unfettered public debate about critically important issues. And so in that respect, strategic studies is as it ever was. But of course, in other respects, not. Um, and let me suggest in particular four ways in which the strategic education of the future should probably differ from that of previous periods. And I've put these forward as four challenges. The first is the diversity of the problem. I completely agree with those who say, you know, it's a mistake to say, well, the Cold War was easy, the Cold War was simple, it was nothing, it, nothing like that. Nonetheless, at least certainly from an American point of view, um, but I think more generally, there is a tremendously diverse range of strategic challenges out there. The jihadi, Islamist, terrorist threat, the rise of China, revanchist, revisionist states <coughs> like Russia, or Iran, or North Korea. Phenomena which may not be entirely new, but, and again, I'll use that term hybrid war, which uh, I understand is highly problematic, uh, nuclear proliferation, and so on. Can we prepare people adequately to address all of these questions? I would say probably not. It is in many ways a more diffuse field in terms of the problem set out there than it was in the past. Is it nonetheless important to make, give people a kind of general competence so that they can understand and discuss those issues? I would say absolutely. And so that is one part of the educational challenge. Strategic studies has always been in many ways a, uh, like a syncretic religion. Um, it, it is, and I think needs to be, multidisciplinary. Now, at the outset, what it really represented, I think, was a synthesis of a very old-fashioned kind of political science and history with a dash of economics as brought in by people like Klaus Dorn. Today, it is important, I think, to be much more diverse. And I thought Amy King's remarks yesterday about bringing economics together with the study of national security issues were very much to the point. I would go beyond that. I would build, for, I very much agree with uh, <coughs> Peter Ho's remarks about psychology. There's an enormous amount to be learned from the study of cognitive psychology where there have really been tremendous advances as we think about, for example, decision making. There needs to be more with anthropology, perhaps more of the material sciences. Personally, I'm somewhat skeptical of big data kinds of studies, but I understand that they're here to stay. Certainly a need for much more area expertise, including linguistic fluency, which is something that is, has lapsed in many ways in recent years, uh, particularly, I would say, vis-a-vis -vis Asia. And I would say, at the end, that military history remains the ballast. Thirdly, the study, or at least the awareness of the, the challenges of implementation and not just ideas. I referred earlier to the intellectualism of strategic studies. A dangerous gap opened up in the aftermath of the Vietnam War in the 1970s as a generation of academics who fundamentally had very little life experience outside the university world at the time grew up and had 
very little knowledge, either direct or vicarious, of how governments and military organizations actually operate, and whose instinct was to have a kind of standoff relationship with the official world. In the United States of late, there's been an interesting academic movement to bridge the gap, and there's some welcome signs. We still have something of an in and out uh, system of government, uh, which I and several others here have been uh, beneficiaries of, but this is still a challenge. The fourth challenge has to do with what I'd refer to as communal entropy. When I went to my first IISS conference in 1985, uh, it was several hundred people, and all the greats were there, you know. Albert Wallstetter, Sam Huntington, Michael Howard, um, and we had the time to talk. That's not what the IISS is like now, and it's not just because of how the place is run. These are much larger, much larger communities, and it's hard to keep them cohesive. Let me conclude by saying something really directed at the professors present. Most of us, as academics, operate in a world in which our professional incentives point to everything except the quality of our teaching. At best, you get some rewards for the quantity of your teaching, how many enrollments, how many courses, but not the quality of our teaching. For too many people, it's the price we pay to do what we really want to do. That is something to fight against and to reject. I know I'm here because of Sam Huntington. Other people are here because of Michael Howard. Others are here because of Bob O'Neill and Hugh Strong and Laurie Friedman. I began by uh, identifying myself as a school teacher. That's not false modesty. It's because potentially, at any rate, I believe there's no more important or more satisfying job in the world. If we have responsibility, uh, again, I'll speak to the professors present, it is to make sure that we grow not only the next generation of strategic thinkers, but the next, next generation of teachers as well. Thank you. Are we connected? Great. Uh, well, I think there is plenty of scope for significant questions, so I guess my role is to try and herd that into the next uh, 20 minutes or so. What I propose to do is to take three questions in a block at the time and hopefully be able to assign one of these wonderful speakers to answer them. So who would like, Amy, Hugh, and Evelyn. Thank you very much for three really stimulating discussions. Um, my comment, more than a question, but there's a question tacked on the end, is perhaps for Hugh, but anyone is, is welcome to respond. We're celebrating two anniversaries this year, the 70th anniversary of the ANU, which was set up in part to understand Asia and the Pacific, Pacific at, the, at that particular time. We're also celebrating the 50th anniversary of SDSC, and as, as Hugh mentioned, T.B. Miller's book in 1966 focused on Australia's uh, defence uh, and, and relationship with Asia. That book was deeply anxious, really, about Australia's place in Asia. It was very worried about all the threats to Australia from Asia. And I think there's a stark difference in understanding those two anniversaries when you think about <coughs> the ANU's goal of setting up to try and understand Asia from Australia, but trying to understand Asia, and strategic studies, and perhaps SDSC, as about our defence from Asia. And it's something I worry about in our discipline, about whether it is actually possible to fuse together the policy, practice, real world aspects with the academic study of whatever it is we study. Do we always have to start from a national Australian perspective, as Hugh said, or a Singaporean or an American perspective? Um, and if so, isn't that fundamentally going to shape the sorts of questions that we ask? If we start from an Australian perspective, we're always going to be worried about the threats to us from Asia. Uh, others of us, and I think myself included, are not remotely interested in studying from an Australian perspective and, and never have really been, and sort of think about the region from outside of Australia. 
But is it possible to, as Elliot Cohen was saying, bring in anthropology, area studies, economics, psychology, and also start from that national perspective? Can we, can we even possibly try to do that? Thank you. This is um, partly an observation. Well, let me begin with an observation in response to Peter Ho, and it's really a question for Hugh White and Elliot Cohen. Um, the observation in relation to Brexit is that it goes much further than the Treasury. Uh, it's related to this whole issue of scenario planning. Uh, in the life of the last government, uh, the National Security Risk Register, which was established in 2010, refused to put the EU and the possibility of British exit from the EU onto the list of strategic risks. Um, and the line, despite the fact that the Joint Parliamentary Committee uh, addressing the National Security Strategy raised that point, the line from the government is, A, we don't want it to happen, therefore we're not going to plan for it, um, and B, that the EU is, and it goes exactly to what Amy said yesterday, is an economic issue, and that is not a security issue. Um, and I raise it just because, in relation to scenario building, it's extraordinarily difficult to escape political presumptions that underpin scenario building. Um, I'm tempted to go on. I, mean, I can think of so-called war games I've at attended, organized within the UK, where actually we've never got to war because we've been so busy thinking of reasons why we shouldn't go to war, uh, when the function has actually been to think how we would fight a war uh, if there were a war. So I think you know, there, there are inherent difficulties uh, which don't invalidate the process of, of you know, going through scenarios and war games, but, but I'm not sure that we've got the answer to how we necessarily get them out of certain presumptions unless you have an immediate contiguous threat uh, that makes that so self-evident. You know, I think if you're Finland facing Russia, you can do it, but, 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 but it might be rather harder uh, when particularly for Australia, to put it in the national context, the threats come from so many different directions. But my substantive question is this. Um, as I listened to you, Hugh, the more you went on, the more I thought, if you take Australia out of what you're saying and put the UK in, it's exactly the same set of questions. Uh, because both of us are dealing with the problem of the US alliance and its centrality and how we handle that relationship, how central it becomes. Here we are at the opposite sides of the world, and actually the core question is, um, where is the US going? Uh, what is its priority in terms of its alliances? And how sharp, far should we configure our defense policy around what we think the US might or might not be doing? Um, and it makes it extraordinarily difficult to be able to resolve the issues that we confront because we're not sure of the guidance or the sense of direction we're getting from the United States. So my, my sort of flippant question is, is geography important here? Because this is, you know, the other side of the world raising the same question. Or is really the core issue the question of the United States and what its intentions are? I mean, Elliot gave you an answer, which was preponderance. Uh, but of course, I'm afraid that's not going to convince all of the people all the time. Professor Go. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the panel for a really stimulating start to the second day of this conference. Thank you for that. I've got two questions. Um, the first is for Peter. Um, Peter, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to connect what you were saying to what you were saying and to ask you a slightly naughty question about whether you might have any advice for Australia about the black elephant of the decline of US preponderance, which I was talking about yesterday. Um, my second question is for Elliot. Um, Elliot, let me declare that I am here because of Rosemary Foot and Kong Yun Fong, um, two non-strategic studies scholars who have had a huge impact on the teaching of strategic studies and related disciplines um, in the UK and in Asia, actually. Um, my question to you is posed in the form of a proposition, which I wondered what you would think about. Um, I think your remarks really highlighted a central tension that we've always had in any centers that teach strategic studies. Is that tension between the policy relevant forms of education that we have to do, which we must do, and the research and scholarly foundations of that teaching? Um, and there are, there are some of us, a very few of us, who are fortunate enough to have traversed the two worlds of scholarship and policy 
but I think we'd agree that that's not the norm. Most of us fall much more heavily in one of those worlds only, with some degree of acquaintance with the other one, either through research or through association or affiliation, one way or the other. Now, and if you accept that that's the norm and that you know, um, those who actually seamlessly move between the two are the rarity, what do we do with that? Right. And here's my proposition. Um, my proposition is mutual respect to begin with. Right? Um, I stand on the scholarly side, and I've always said to my audiences that you have policy expertise, which I don't have. Right? But I have research expertise, which I don't believe many of you do have. How do we talk across that and bring to each other channels and information and data and findings which are mutually useful, right, um, is the challenge. Um, and I wondered what you thought about that and how that may or may not feed into experience of educating strategic studies scholars and practitioners. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start with Hugh and come through the panel that way. Right. Thanks, Amy. Sure. Great. Great. <laughs> yes, Admiral. Great question. Right at the heart of the issue. This is indiscreet, um, but sometimes you write lines in speeches for one's principles that live in your heart. And a line I wrote for Hawke once was that Australia should seek security not from Asia, but in Asia. <coughs> He had it in and with Asia, which broke the rhythm of the sentence, and I've never forgiven him. But, it, it, but it's a terribly important thought. But I actually think it cuts directly to the point I'm making. Because the great temptation for Australia is to think that with an Anglo-Saxon dominant great power in Asia, we don't have to worry too much about those guys. And there is a reason why the decades after 1948 were a golden era in Australian strategic studies. And there's a reason why the last couple of years have been, shall we say, a bronze era in Australian Asian studies. Is it the more we become confident the United States will dominate Asia and make Asia safe for us, the less we've felt we have to build our own future in Asia. And so it, it is, it, so I, I think, it, in, in fact, understanding what I would see is at least the potential fragility of US preponderance. It's essential to understanding why it's so important to get ahead around it. Now, the second point to make is that my conception of strategic studies is slightly broader than Elliot's. I love the line about it's narrow and old fashioned and backward looking, and that's why I like it. I, I actually, but I just broaden it out slightly. You know, my <coughs> definition is to do anything to do with the role of armed forces in international affairs. And that means, that includes the construction of orders in Asia or elsewhere, which reduce the role of armed forces in international affairs. And to me, one of the core objectives of strategic policy, one of the core objectives of strategic studies in supporting policy is to help conceive, design, and create international orders in which the use of armed force becomes less likely. And the reason why people like Evelyn and you have a vital place in SDS is because that's exactly what you contribute. So I do think a central role for Australia, central role for strategic policy, central role for um, for strategic studies is to help imagine what kind of order in Asia will reduce the risk of us finding ourselves having to defend ourselves from Asia. I also think we have to guard against the possibility that doesn't work. But I think the really important thing for us, and I guess the message I was trying to convey, is that we better stop assuming that the only conceivable model, and the only model we have to worry about and think about, is the one in which the United States primacy does it. The United States primacy has done it. That's why I love it so much but I don't think we can assume it continues to do that work in the future. Hugh, there's a marvellous passage at the beginning of Michael Howard's The Continental Commitment, in which he says, anyone studying British military defence policy from the turn of the century through to, I think he was writing in the 1970s, will be struck by a remarkable series of continuities. And he then has a long and beautifully elegant sentence constructed with semicolons, in, in which he says, you know, the balance between our concerns in Europe and for the empire, the balance of our alliance on the United States, etc., etc. There are about half a dozen elements. You can run through that and reframe it precisely to mirror Australia 
And so the basic point you're making is absolutely correct. There are curious similarities. But there is, and, and so I therefore think, you know, I'm basically agreeing with your basic point, but I do think the geography makes a huge difference. Because for Britain, as ever, perhaps less this month than last month, there is an alternative. There is Europe. Um, th there is a strategic concept for Britain in, a str in strategic integration with Europe. And in a sense, you know, the whole point that Michael Howard was talking about, the whole history of a British strategic policy, or the last person I had to tell this to, is the choice between whether, you, whether it sees itself as an oceanic and global power in which the alliance with the United States is central, or it sees itself primarily as a European power contributing to maintaining a stable international order in Europe. And whatever happens to the alliance with America, Britain still has that option to deal with whatever strategic, the most intense strategic problems for Britain will always emerge in Europe, that's close to home, and there is always that option for Britain. And one of the reasons why I think Brexit's a bit peculiar, because I think it has huge implications for the way British sees its role in Europe at a time when Europe's own strategic future is very much up for grabs, and it's turning its back on that, turning back towards what you might call a more global oceanic alliance dominated uh, time at a point where I think the US role, including the US role in Europe, is much less assured than it has been in the, in the, in the, in the past. Whereas Australia has no such alternative. W at the only concept we've had, stretching back to you know, 1883 or 1788, is either to, to, to the tall terms we has, has, has been to depend on an ally or to try and stand by ourselves. And I actually don't think either of those is going to work for us, which gets back to my point about Amy. I do think whatever future Australia has, it's not going to be, well, it could be, to try and become a Switzerland of the South Pacific. I don't actually think that's going to be our best option. I think our best option is going to involve some kind of integration, even with the United States is not playing a critical role or any role. It's going to require some kind of integration. But we still have to build that. I think for Britain, it's it's ready-made, or at least it's, it's there building on 500 years of, of uh, mostly pretty successful strategic history. Yeah. Well, uh, there are a lot of questions and issues which were raised by the uh, uh, three people from the floor. And I'll try to respond by taking a practical policy-making viewpoint. And I'll, I'll link all the questions together uh, with an assertion that we have entered a, a, a very unusual phase in a, a, which follows a period where changes were taking place but at a fairly uh, a gradual rate. I think we have entered a phase of our history in which change is actually accelerating. Uh, there, are, there are a whole lot of reasons uh, for this. Uh, you know, some academics call this the Anthropocene because this is the first time human beings are impacting on uh, the uh, uh, global environment. But the key point is change is accelerating. And because change is accelerating, uh, you cannot uh, expect that what worked well for us in the past is going to work well for us in the future. There are going to be more big shocks, not black elephants, but the black swans and unknown unknowns and their frequency uh, is going to pack up. And governments uh, and any policymaker, any planner, any academic who is thinking seriously about the future has to be prepared to set aside all the, uh, uh, all the past glories and think about a much more uncertain future. All assumptions cast aside, let's look at things afresh. And that is why it's actually very important to find techniques to help you overcome some of these uh, emotional attachments to things that uh, brought us to where we are today and start looking at things afresh. Whether it is a US preponderance uh, or whether it is uh, the relationship between the United Kingdom and Europe or, or whatever, you know, things are going to change. And the more we spend time thinking about that kind of future, I think uh, the better off uh, we are going to be. And that is why uh, I, I made this argument for uh, thinking about the future. I just want to add one more thing on this uh, risk problem. I'm familiar with the National Risk Register in the UK. Uh, 
and I used to be very skeptical about the risk register. It might not have identified uh, Brexit as a, as a risk. But generally, the purpose, I think, of uh, talking about risk in a public way is to get some kind of consensus about what the important challenges are. It's a social, risk is a social construct when it comes to dealing with the big uh, problems. So in the Netherlands, you know, everybody agrees that flooding is a big problem. In Japan, everybody agrees that uh, earthquakes are a big problem until you have something like Fukushima occur. But once you uh, can agree on what the problem is, uh, it's a bipartisan uh, a consensus and resources are all made available. So the question is, is there enough uh, conversation about what the future risks uh, facing a country are? And a future risk uh, for a country like Australia could well be uh, uh, diminishing of US preponderance, but this is for Australia to, to decide. So that's my response. Okay, Elliot. So uh, let me try to address each of them. Uh, Amy, to your uh, question, it seems to me actually it's very useful to start from a national perspective. And that's not just my view, that's Aristotle's view. Uh, you know, in, in the politics, Ar Aristotle says, that the beginning, which is the beginning of political science, is you start from the position of the citizen, and that leads you to ask questions which get bigger and bigger. And, and given that this is a practical kind of field, I think that's where you start. That doesn't mean that you're blinkered, it doesn't mean that you're chauvinistic, it doesn't mean that you can't think about lots of other places. But I, I think as a place, point of departure, it's very good, in part because it keeps you practically uh, minded. Hugh, to the, um, the issue of the uh, UK register. So my, my response would be that th there is no bureaucratic process that can prevent a failure of imagination or a failure of intellectual courage. And some of this is just having the courage to say, you know what, this could happen. And if it happens, we're gonna have to deal with it. That's, about, that's character, that, that is fundamentally about character and to some extent about judgment. And again, to go back to what I was saying about education, part of, I mean, we used to think that part of the job of education was developing character. It's certainly about developing judgment. And, and so I would take it from there. To your point about the, the alliance, uh, so let me just first, a, an American perspective. I, you know, I, I fully understand, you know, from the point of view of the UK or, you know, poor Australia. Uh, you know, here you are chained to this big crazy beast. So from our point of view, you guys play us like a fiddle. You really do. You really do. My former student, Roger Noble, is the deputy commanding general in uh, downrange. There are all kinds of Brits and Australians wandering around the Pentagon. We actually pay attention to you. We get concerned when you're upset with us. So, so I, mean, I would just ask you to imagine what it's like to be you know, the poor benighted hegemon who, who, who feels more like Gulliver than, um, you know, the uh, overlord. Um, you know, the, the other thing is, I'd like to quote a great governor general of Australia, uh, my favorite World War II general, uh, William Slim, who has this great passage in Defeat into Victory, which says, you know, allies, oh God, awful. The only thing that's worse than going to war with allies is going to war without allies. <laughs> and, and that's an important thing we should all remember. And Americans better remember that, and that's very much to Tom Christensen's point yesterday, and I hope you people remember that too. You've got a really good alliance. My view is, you know, you, you have an alliance with a really powerful country. You don't have that alliance, alliance, you get a chance to be a client of China. Not an ally, a client. And I don't think that that's a very promising future, future for anybody. I do think those first order questions, though, for all of our publics need to be addressed. And they need to be addressed by people like us. And that's a plug for my next book, which will be out in January. <laughs> Evelyn, uh, three, three responses to your question. My old uh, mentor, Sam Huntington, used to say that the job of the old Center for International Affairs, uh, which I think was much better than the current one uh, mm -hmm. at Harvard, was, he said, we're in the business of policy-relevant basic research. I think that's, it's a nice phrase, and I think it captures something that's, uh, that can be quite valuable. I'm not saying that's all one should do. I mean, in, in 
and I just know from my own writing, I periodically flee to the 18th century when the 21st gets too ugly. Um, but, but there's something to be said for that. Secondly, I think it is very important, particularly when training young academics, but, but in general, you know, students, is to develop in them empathy. Not sympathy, but empathy with people who actually have to make decisions. And just from the technique point of view, I think a lot of that, that's why I'm a big believer in staff rides, which we do a lot of simulations, historical case studies, um, simply bringing policymakers, not to badger them about how they're handling relationships with the country, but just tell me what your daily life is like and how do decisions get presented. I think there's, that, that's really important for us as academics to do with policymakers. Conversely, there's actually, I believe, a fair bit that academics can offer the policymaker, and it's partly because we are fundamentally childlike, and we often ask childlike questions. My favorite childlike question, which I periodically asked, is, so why do you think this is gonna work? What, why is the things that you say we should do, or that we are doing, what, just tell me the story of how that leads to the outcome you say you want. That question actually, get, at least in my government, doesn't get asked very often, and there are very rarely good answers when it does get asked. 